Properties of transition metals. In this video, we're going to talk about the common properties of transition metals in the periodic table, and then we're going to use the electronic structure of transition metals to explain some of the properties, like the adoption of plus two oxidation states and paramagnetism. So transition metals make up most of the D subshell, and they encompass everything from group 3 to group 11. So that's essentially all of the D block except group 12. We find that all of these elements are solid metals at room temperature, and the thing that makes them transition metals is the fact that they have a partially filled D subshell. And this characteristic kind of electronic configuration gives rise to a number of properties that are common throughout the transition metals. So the first property to point out is that transition metals often have variable oxidation states. What this means is they can form stable compounds in a number of different oxidation states. This isn't something that can normally be said for group 1 and 2 metals, for example. However, these metals exhibit a number of different oxidation states. Shown on the right here are your first row D-block elements. I've included zinc, even though this isn't technically a transition metal, remember. And you can see that some of the elements only have one stable oxidation state. Scandium is only really stable in the plus three state, zinc in the plus two. However, most of these elements, these transition metals, have a number of different oxidation states that they are stable in. For example, vanadium, you can find it in compounds with a plus two, plus three, plus four, or plus five oxidation state. Secondly, a property that we find is that transition metals generally form complex ions with ligands. What that means is if you put these transition metals into solution, with some species called a ligand, you find that they form some kind of a covalently bonded network. Now a full explanation of this is given in the following video, so for now you just need to remember that transition metals form complex ions with ligands. We find that these complexes are often coloured, so this here is an example of a copper compound, you can see it's blue in colour. Again in a following video we'll explain how these colours arise from forming these complex ions. We also see that transition metals often have specific magnetic properties, and these arise out of the fact that they have they all have a partially filled D subshell. That was the that was the only criteria that needed to be fulfilled for something to be classified as a transition metal, and this gives rise to magnetic properties, which we'll explain in a later slide. Finally, we find that transition metals often display catalytic ash action. What that means is they are able to catalyze certain reactions. So for example, if we took something like the Harbour process, that is nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas coming together to form ammonia, NH3, we find that this reaction goes faster if it's done in the presence of an iron surface. Iron is able to catalyze this reaction and make it go more quickly. And we see that lots of the transition metals are able to do similar things to different reactions. So one property that we also see quite often is that transition metals can almost always adopt a plus two oxidation state. Scandium is a bit of an outlier and is sometimes not considered a trans transition metal at all. But in general, we can see that this plus two oxidation state is one of the ones that is common for most of our transition metals. Now, the reason for this is that if we look at our first row transition metals, most of those have a electronic configuration that's going to end with 4s2, 3dn, some number of electrons in those d orbitals. Our second row, we're looking at an electronic configuration that ends with 5s2, 4dn, some number of electrons in those 4d orbitals. And we could write something similar for the next row, we'd just be looking at the 6s and the 5d. But usually we're going to have a full s orbital and then a partially filled d orbital straight after that. And if you remember, when we ionize from transition metals, we actually remove electrons first from the s orbitals and then from the d orbitals. So the 4s is electrons are moved before the 3d, the 5s are removed before the 4d. And what that means is that often it's relatively low energy and quite an accessible process to remove the two s electrons. This gives rise to a stable plus two oxidation state because you can always just remove those two electrons that are in S that are in the S sublevel. So as we've said previously, zinc is in the first row of the D block, however, it is not considered a transition metal. And actually none of those group 12 elements are. 
Now the reason for this is we said transition metals have an incomplete D subshell, whereas if we write out the electronic configuration of zinc, we see that the D subshell is completely filled here. We have 10 electrons in our D subshell, and so it doesn't have an incomplete D subshell and it's not a transition metal. Equally, if we take its most common ion, Zn2+, all that's going to do is remove two electrons from our 4s and give us 4s0. We've still got a completely full 3d subshell, so we're still not a transition metal. As I said, this is the same for all of our group 12 elements, because those are all going to have a full 3d in the case of that third row, 4d in the fourth row, etc., etc. So finally, thinking about the magnetic properties of transition metals. Now this all arises out of the fact that when you have an incomplete d subshell, you always end up with some net spin. So if you take an example of a transition metal, something like manganese, I can write out its electronic configuration in terms of an electron box model. So we know that all of our electrons have some spin associated with them. They're either spin up or spin down. And what we find is that if electrons are if electrons are paired up, so for example, we take these two electrons in the 1s orbital, the spin of these two electrons cancels each other out, because one is spin up, one is spin, out, spin down, so the net result is no spin. And this is the same for all of our full sublevels. We've always got the same number of spins up and spins down, so they cancel out. However, when we get to the incomplete 3d subshell, we see here we just have five spins all pointing in the same direction, which means we have a net spin that is pointing upwards in this case. If we moved along to something like iron instead, and we just added one more electron, that electron goes here, we've still got a net spin, because although one of the spins in our 3D subshell is now cancelled out, we've still got four electrons all pointing in the same direction, with no electrons pointing in the other direction, so we've still got a net spin. And you'll find that as long as your D subshell is incomplete and it isn't completely filled, you're always going to have a net spin. Now this doesn't mean that the materials are magnetic, so I could have a collection of ion atoms. They all have some net spin, because they all have these four unpaired electrons. But in the absence of any kind of influencing factors, those spins are all going to point in random directions. And the end result is that they have no effect, because they're all randomly oriented, and so they all cancel each other out. However, if I apply an external magnetic field, so I'm going to represent that in red here, if I apply a magnetic field, i.e. I get a magnet and I put it near my sample of iron, what I'll find is that all of these iron atoms will start to align in the same direction. And this process is called paramagnetism. So iron and all of the other transition metals are paramagnetic because they have some net spin, they have some leftover spin that's unpaired, that can align with an external magnetic field, and what it does is it will enhance this field. So key points to take home from this video, we saw that transition metals were everything from group 3 to 11, they all have a partially filled D subshell. For that reason, zinc is not a transition metal, and neither is anything else in group 12, because they always have a full D subshell. We discussed some common properties of transition metals, i.e. they often adopt a plus 2 oxidation state, that's stable for all transition metals, um, they often are able to catalyze reactions, they form colored complexes with ligands, and they display magnetic properties. Specifically, those partially filled subshells always give rise to some overall net spin of electrons. That can align with an external magnetic field, and that process is known as paramagnetism.